I recently used this video, Inner Life of the Cell, as a background video for the recent video I had made, Functional Proteins and Information for Body Plans, with Stephen Meyer. A funny thing about the background video, Inner Life of the Cell, that I had used in my recent Stephen Meyer video, is that in 2006, Dr. William Dembski, who is a leading proponent of intelligent design, and before the inner life of the cell video went viral on the web, would show that particular video in his speaking engagements on intelligent design. He did so, so as to clearly illustrate the intelligent design of the cell. The apparent design of the cell literally leaps right out at you from the video as you watch the Inner Life video. In 2007, some Darwinists caught wind of Dr. Dembski using the video in his talks on intelligent design and contacted Harvard BioVisions, who had made the Inner Life of the Cell video to try to stop Dr. Dembski from using the video in his talks on intelligent design. They cited copyright infringement on the video. I believe legal action was threatened against Dr. Dembski. Although I don't know all the details of the matter, what I do know is that the video in question soon thereafter went viral on the web and the point of copyright infringement became moot since now anyone with access to the internet can see the inner life of the cell video from any one of a multitude of sites on the web where it was downloaded and was out of reach of US copyright laws. Anyway, Fast forward from 2007 to 2014. In 2014, trying to repair what damage the inner life of the cell video had apparently done to Darwinian claims, Harvard BioVisions released another video that tried to make the inner workings of the cell as bumpy and ugly as possible, in other words, as Darwinian as possible. Here's a clip from their bumpy and ugly Darwinian video. And here is the New York Times article that explained the quote-unquote Darwinian reasoning behind the video. The author Carl Zimmer states, In the 2006 version of Inner Life of the Cell, we can't help seeing intention in the smooth movements of the molecules. It's as if they're trying to get from one place to another. In reality, however, the parts of our cells don't operate with the precise movements of springs and gears of a the clock. They flail blindly in a crowd. Our cells work almost in spite of themselves. In response, in this article entitled Flailing Blindly, Dr. Jonathan Wells refers to their depiction of proteins flailing blindly in the crowd as being pseudoscientific. Dr. Wells also stated, the new animation like the old also includes a kinesin molecule hauling a vesicle, but this time the kinesin's movements are characterized in Zimmer's words by barely constrained randomness they flail blindly in the crowd. 
Dr. Wells goes on to state, but that's not what the biological evidence shows. In fact, Kennison moves quickly with precise movements to get from one place to another. A Kennison molecule takes one eight nanometer step along a microtubule for every high energy ATP molecule it uses, and it uses about 80 ATPs per second. On the scale of a living cell, this movement is very fast. To visualize it on a microscopic scale, imagine a microtubule as one lane road and the Kinesin molecule as an automobile. The Kinesin would be traveling over 200 miles per hour. The fact that the cell's cytoplasm is quite crowded makes this even more remarkable like an automobile going 200 miles per hour through a traffic jam. Moreover, much contrary to their Darwinian claim that the actions within the cell are quote unquote barely constrained randomness, in an article entitled The Cell as a Collection of Protein Machines, Bruce Alberts who was editor-in-chief of science from 2009 to 2013 and who served two six-year terms as the president of the National Academy of Science, Sciences stated, we have always underestimated the cells. Undoubtedly, we still do today, but at least we are no longer as naive as we were when I was a graduate student in the 1960s. Then, most of us viewed cells as containing a giant set of second order reactions. Molecules A and B were thought to diffuse freely, randomly colliding with each other to produce molecule AB, and likewise for many other molecules that interact with each other inside the cell. But as it turns out, we can walk and talk because the chemistry that makes life possible is much more elaborate and sophisticated than anything we students had ever considered. Instead of a cell dominated by randomly colliding individual protein molecules, we now know that nearly every major process in a cell is carried out by assemblies of 10 or more protein molecules. And as it carries out its biological functions, each of these protein assemblies interacts with several other large complexes of proteins. Indeed, the entire cell can be viewed as a factory that contains an elaborate network of interlocking assembly lines, each of which is composed of a set of large protein machines. And in this following video, Professor Jim A. Khalili, hopefully I pronounced that right, who is Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of Surrey, takes issue with the current balls and sticks models of molecules that are used by biologists such as the model that was used in the bumpy and ugly Darwinian video and he also states that life has a certain order that is quote unquote very different from the random ther thermodynamic jostling of atoms and molecules in inanimate matter of the same complexity. Billion of a meter. My area is the atomic nucleus, which is the tiny dot inside an atom. It's even smaller uh, in scale. But this is the domain of quantum mechanics, and, and uh, physicists and chemists have had a long time to try and get used to it. Biologists, on the other hand, have got off lightly, in my view. They are very happy with their balls and sticks models of molecules. <laughs> The balls are the atoms, the sticks are the bonds between the atoms, and when they can't build them physically in the lab, nowadays they have very powerful computers that will simulate a huge molecule. So this is a, a protein made up of 100,000 atoms. It doesn't really require much in the way of quantum mechanics to explain it. Quantum man begged to differ with this idea. Erwin Schrödinger, he of Schrödinger's cat fame, 
He was an Austrian physicist. He was one of the founders of quantum mechanics in the 1920s. In 1944, he wrote a book called "What Is Life." It was tremendously influential. It influenced Francis Crick and James Watson, the discoverers of the double helix structure of DNA. To paraphrase a description in the book, he says, "At the molecular level, living organisms have a certain order, a structure to them, that's very different from the random thermodynamic jostling of atoms and molecules." In inanimate matter of the same complexity. In fact, living matter seems to behave in its order, in its structure, just like inanimate matter cooled down to near absolute zero, where quantum effects play a very important role. There's something special about the structure, the order inside a living cell. So Schrödinger speculated that maybe quantum mechanics plays a role in life. And in this 2014 article entitled "You're You're Powered by Quantum Mechanics," no, really, Professor Akalili states that life cannot be based on the order from disorder rules of thermodynamics. A related interest to this simplistic balls and sticks models of molecules. As Professor Kalili termed it, Granville Sewell, who is professor of mathematics at the University of Texas El Paso, and who analyzed the Schrödinger equation in detail, stated that if elementary particles interacted by bouncing off each other like tiny balls obeying classical Newtonian laws, chemistry would be dead. Moreover, the billiard ball models of atoms and molecules, which they used in their ugly protein packing video, is basically a fallacious 19th and earliest 20th century construct that has drastically changed. Instead of a bumpy billiard ball model, now we have a farther, far smoother quantum cloud model. As you can see in this timeline. Moreover, in this following video, you can see for yourselves that the billiard ball model of atoms that was used as the basic model in the protein packing video is a completely wrong model for over the atom. Over a hundred years after its discovery, we can actually see what an electron might look like by using the computer technology it created. One of the neatest pictures that sums up the quantum world is, is the one where a, a ring of atoms has been made as, as a little fence. You can see the waves of, of what used to be thought of as quantum particles, sort of filling this quantum corral, as it's called. They can't escape.、Uh, they're stuck inside there, and the waviness is kind of frozen there and can be photographed.、Um, that's something that, that the quantum pioneers would have loved to see. Schrödinger would have said, "Way cool, dude." Don Eigler at IBM has used a quantum microscope to make pictures of atomic surfaces. Each step in this picture of a surface is just one atom high. On top of the atoms, the wavy pattern is caused by a sea of electrons. These are just the electrons which are are trapped in the surface layer,、uh, but within the surface layer, they're free to move around. These electrons are waves, and the waves,、um, when they move, they Sometimes bang into features on our surface, like the step edges, or the individual atoms which might be sticking out of the surface. And when a wave、uh, bangs into something, it reflects off of that thing. And when you have a reflected wave adding together with the incoming part of the wave, it sets up what we call a standing wave. These are regions where there are large oscillations, which are are fixed where they are in space, and regions where oscillations go to zero. I've always felt that the wave function was just a description of a reality, and the reality was deeper. It was a particle, and the wave function was just something mathematical up in a physicist's head. To actually see a physical wave function rippling across the surface is rather disturbing. If I was really honest, I'd 
probably have to tell you that I need to go back and reassess the way I've pictured the world. Well, I'm, I'm probably somewhere in error, or maybe I'm just a heretic. I don't believe in this wave-particle duality mumbo-jumbo. I think it's mostly just um, the leftover baggage of, of having started off understanding the world in terms of particles and then being forced because of the quantum revolution to think of the world in terms of waves and we're stuck with this dualistic way of, of looking at these very small particles. Don't even think about them as particles. Electrons are waves. And if you think of them in terms of waves, you will always end up with the right answer. Always. Moreover, protein molecules themselves are now found to be in a quantum coherent superposition state. In fact, in this recent article, we find that quantum co coherence has now been observed in individual protein molecules. The author states, if you take certain atoms and make them as cold as, cold as possible, can as they possibly can be, the atoms will fuse into a collective low energy quantum state called a Bose Einstein condensate. In 1968, a physicist predicted that a similar process at a much higher temperature could concentrate all of the vibrational energy in a bio biological protein into its lowest frequency vibrational mode. Now scientists in Sweden and Germany have the first experimental evidence of, of such so-called condensation states in proteins. And, and in this following article, you can actually see from electron microscope photographs of the flagellum that the molecular machines of a cell are not nearly as bumpy and ugly as they tried to portray in their protein packing video, but are instead fairly smooth in their contours. Here are the photographs where you can see for yourself. As well, in this article, we find that the flagellar motor does not belong to classical classical mechanics, but to quantum mechanics. Moreover, in this article entitled How Biomolecular Machines Can Generate Non-Trivial Quantum States, we find that quantum entanglement in biological systems can be maintained even in the presence of very intense noise. And in this article, the articles remark that this reverses previous orthodoxy which held quantum effects cannot exist in biological systems because of the amount of noise in the systems. In fact, they go on to state envi environmental noise here drives a persistent and cyclic generation of new entanglement. And in this, besides molecular machines, in this article on photosynthesis, photosynthesis, we find that these biological systems can direct a quantum process, in this case, energy transport, in astoundingly subtle, subtle and controlled ways showing remarkable resistance to aggressive random background noise of biology and extreme environments. As well, besides molecular machines and photosynthesis, we find that DNA itself does not belong to classical mechanics but belongs to quantum mechanics. In this video, Dr. Reifer mathematically echoes Professor Al Khalili's observation that living matter seems to behave in its order and structure just like inanimate matter cooled down to near absolute zero. At the 19.30 minute mark, 
she reveals that longitudinal quantum information resides along the entire length of DNA and at the 24 minute mark she remarks that practically the whole DNA molecule can be viewed as quantum information that has classical information embedded within it. A related interest to quantum DNA is this article. DNA has been found to have the bizarre ability to pull itself together, even at a distance, when according to no, known science, it shouldn't be able to. There is no known reason why DNA is able to combine the way it does, and from a current theoretical standpoint, this feat should be chemically impossible. Also a real related interest to quantum DNA is this recent article. That was a total bombshell. He, like many others, had assumed that loops in DNA form when two stretches of free-floating DNA randomly find each other and are fastened by a pair of proteins, but that can't be right. The loops must be forming in a completely different way one that is deliberate and controlled. Of related interest, the way in which proteins communicate with each other in the cell is found to be a precisely controlled quantum and biophotonic process, and the communication in the cell is not governed primarily by the proteins randomly colliding into each other as has been wrongly assumed by Darwinian materialists for decades. In this article, it is found that if you tap on a bell, it rings for some time and with a sound that is specific to the bell. That, this is how the proteins behave. Many scientists had previously thought a protein is more like a wet sponge than a bell. If you tap on a wet sponge, you don't get any sustained sound. And in this article, the authors state that as far back as 1948, Schrodinger, the inventor of modern quantum mechanics, published the book What is Life. In it, he suggested that quantum mechanics and coherent ringing might be the basis of all biochemical reactions. At the same time, this idea never found wide acceptance because it was generally assumed that vibrations in protein molecules would be too rapidly damped. Now, scientists at the University of Glasgow have proven he was on the right track after all. Using modern laser spectroscopy, the scientists have been able to measure the vibrational spectrum of a protein that fights off bacteria. They discovered that this enzyme rings like a bell with a frequency of a few terahertz or a million million hertz. Most remarkably, the ringing involves the entire protein. This research shows us that proteins have mechanical properties that are highly unexpected and geared towards maximizing efficiency. Needless to say, that certainly does not sound like mo protein molecules randomly colliding into each other as Darwinian materialists uh, assumed in their protein packing video, but instead sounds very much like a precisely engineered system that far exceeds anything man has ever engineered or built in terms of communication. Moreover, quantum vibrations and microtubules in the brain are now shown in this following article to produce beat frequencies and thus offers a solution to the mysterious origins of EG, EEG rhythms. You can read it here in this. And uh, it is important to note that quantum entanglement and quantum coherence are both non-local 
beyond space and time effects. In the following article, the author states that these two kinds of non-locality, entanglement and coherence, have precisely the same basis. And he also states, whereas the EPR entanglement connections are fragile, some forms of non-local coherence are robust. In fact, in this article, in March 4th, 1916, it is found the greater the number of particles in a quantum hypergraph state, the more strongly it violates local realism with the strength increasing exponentially with the number of particles. Now, of one final note, the implications of finding quantum non-locality in molecular biology on a massive scale in every DNA and protein molecule is non-trivial. In fact, finding non-local beyond space and time quantum coherence in bi biology provides tentative evidence that we do indeed have a soul that lives beyond the death of our bodies just as has been claimed by theologians for centuries. In these two videos, which you can watch at your leisure, Stuart Hameroff reflects on the spiritual implications of finding non-trivial quantum mechanics in molecular biology. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching.